Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, John. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you, Michael. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. And I love your your hat. I oh, love... thank you. I'm a very patriotic Canadian. <laughs> you are. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> there is no doubt in knowing where you're from. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. I was born in Toronto, but mostly I've grown up in Vancouver. Great. Great. Right. Sorry about that motorcycle <laughs> or whatever that is. Hopefully hopefully it goes pretty soon. Anyway, sorry. Uh, I didn't hear the motorcycle. I didn't hear oh, okay. the motorcycle. <laughs> oh, good. I can hear but, you driving crazy. Always leaving oh, now. So thank, thank goodness. <laughs> bye bye, motorcycle. Yeah. Good riddance. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> right. Okay. So, John, it's, it's great to have you on the show. I know you've had to wait a long time to get to this one. So, I appreciate oh, your that's patience. Fine. I appreciate and you having me on. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So it's it's a very simple question I'm going to start with, and then I'm sure I will ask other questions along the way. But the first question, John, for you is, tell us a bit about you sure. and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Well, I'm 56 years old, and I always felt that I was meant to do something creative with my life. But for the first two thirds of my life, I really spent a lot of time goofing around, just being a couch potato. I was content to you know, watch my DVDs after work. And I used to be very overweight. I was, a, I'm a recovering sugarholic and I, it's a wonder that I didn't give myself type two diabetes. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. I know I'm not the only one. And um, one day about three years ago, and I don't mean to be pushy or preachy about this stuff. I'm just sharing my story. I kind of felt like I was nearing the end of my rope in life and not to be too overly melodramatic about it, but I was spending far too much time by myself. And I sort of had it in my mind's eye. Well, you know, I've had my 20s, 30s and 40s. I'm 53 now. And like, why would my 60s and 70s be any different from where my life is now? And what I did was I reached out to God and I just said, God, I, I don't know if you're real. I don't know if I'm talking to myself, but hmm. I feel like I'm the kind of person that tries a little bit harder when I have it in my mind's eye that someone who loves me is watching me. And I think that, to, that it's human nature to a large degree. You know, you're, you're in school and you're playing baseball. And maybe you're not really into it, but then suddenly your mom or your dad shows up and they're watching you. Suddenly you might get you might get into it. You know, your attitude might might be a little bit more. You might try a little bit harder because the one who loves you the most is watching you. So I'd written these short stories around 2005 at work. I'm a security guard. I've been a security guard for 35 years, believe it or not. And one day I was just bored out of my mind. I've always loved to read. And I've always like writing is always something that I've done sporadically over the course of my life. But I yeah. cranked out these 50 or 60 bite-sized short stories. I created a character called Lee Hacklin. He's a private investigator and he's a smoker and a drinker and he's a man's man, but he has a heart of gold. And I dusted these stories off three years ago and I read them. And it was the first time where I was able to read something that I'd written as if someone else had written them. And I thought, gosh, right. you know, I don't know if this is great literature. Well, I know it's not great literature, but I'm having a good time reading them. And I really like this guy probably because he's an idealized version of myself, which I, I think is something that a lot of writers do. I'm sure that's what Ian Fleming did when he created James Bond, yes. or Tom Clancy when he created Jack Bryan, or, or Robert, Robert, Robert. Probably the biggest influence for me as a writer is uh, Robert B. Parker. Are you familiar with him? He no, created I'm not. A he created a character called Spencer, which was a movie recently, Spencer Confidential with, with Mark Wahlberg. I didn't see it. But um, he's sort of the American Sherlock Holmes. Oh, okay, and, great. Uh, based, based in Boston. And I read his books back in the day. And his books are told from a first-person narrative. Yeah. And I remember thinking, well, gosh, I, I can do this. I mean, I don't know. I can't do it as well. But I think this is something that I would like to do. So in, in any event, I cobbled these short stories together. And it became my first book. There he goes, shamelessly plugging his product, The Collected Cases of Lee Hacklin, 1970s Private Investigator, book one. And it was, right. you know, you and I lived in it. I don't know how old you are, but you and I lived in an age when none of this stuff existed, right? I was born in 1965. So I'm not a tech savvy guy. It's it's just like, it took me forever in a day just to turn on my first computer. You know, like, where's the power right. button, you know? <laughs> and so I had, uh, uh, this is a good, great life lesson, especially for men. You know, men, we don't, we don't like to ask people for help. If I didn't ask people to help me, I'd still be trying to post 
that first book. It was a real uphill struggle for me because I, initially I dealt with Amazon and now I mm. deal with draft to digital. I find it to be much simpler. And so it took me about a month of, of going to the library after work and on my days off. And I kept going in circles. I was losing my mind because Amazon wasn't accepting my banking information. And then I kept going to the bank and they said, no, it's the right information. And I just, I just kept plugging in the same data again and again, and it wasn't working. And finally, I got that first book up. And again, with tremendous help, every time I walked into the library, the staff would look at me like, oh, here he is again. You know, the, the hopeless guy, you, you have to hold his hand, right? <laughs> but I had to do that. You know, you have to, you have to suck up, you have to put your ego on the shelf sometimes. Yes. And so, have you seen the movie Billy Elliot? Yes. Okay, so you remember when his dad takes him to the, the ballet school and the auditioners ask him, how, how do you feel when you dance? He said, well, I feel like electricity. That's how I felt when I posted that first book. And for me, it was a very unusual feeling. It, it yeah. feeling that I actually started something and there were hiccups and potholes along the way and I didn't <clears throat> bail. And I don't mean to be overly self-denigrating, but during the course of the first 53 years of my life, that's kind of been my late motif. Not so much if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Like for example, when I was a kid, I, I wanted to be a comic book artist. I was really into drawing and then and I was good at it. But then I got lazy and I didn't stick with it. And then I tried acting for a couple of years. Um, did you ever watch a show called Big Valley back in the day? Do you remember that show? No. It was a Western. So anyway, one of the stars of that show, uh, Peter Breck, he came to Vancouver and he started an acting school called the Breck Academy. And that was right. an amazing experience. I got to meet Gene Hackman. I got to meet wow. uh, Richard Dreyfus. They came to the Academy because they worked with Peter on, on other projects. But um, And I was an extra in Rocky IV, believe it or not. You don't see me in the movie, but I was there for one day. The big fight at the end was shot at the Agrodome in Vancouver. So I got to see Stallone and, and Dolph Lundgren duke it out in the ring. That was a great experience. But unfortunately, and I don't mean to gross anybody out, but I developed psoriasis. And I've mm -hmm. always had very dry skin. And it just got exponentially uh, worse and worse. And of course, my diet wasn't helping because sugar uh, is, is inflammatory. Right. And yeah. also stressing, stressing over every little thing and uh, you know, living in a sort of a state of self-immolation and constantly doubting myself. And I, I read a lot of self-help books and I was in therapy for a year and I found all of that to be tremendously uh, beneficial. I don't feel like doing any of that was a waste of time. But so when I was about 25, I gave up on my dream of acting because of my basically because I was just too self-conscious about my skin. I'm mean, like literally pieces of of. of flaky dry skin were coming yes. off my face that's how bad it was yeah. and of course it doesn't do a lot for one's self-confidence particularly when it comes to romantic relationships so i don't mean to paint a picture of myself as a, as a recluse or a pariah but i was living you know the old saying no man is an island i was kind of i was kind of becoming more and more of an island and that's why i reached out to god because i just i just reached a saturation point where this this life of living vicariously uh, watching other people's stories was was just not not cutting it for me anymore. I always knew that I could do better. So now it's three years later. I started doing this three years ago, and now I've got. I'm, I'm actually I'm uploading another book today. I just finished another book last night. Lee Hacklin, 1970s private investigator in Review to a Kill, which is about a serial killer of movie critics, and and the inspiration for that one is my love for uh, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert. And, and watching sneak previews and, and Siskel and Ebert at the movies. And, and that's, you know, that's where I get, you know, I think that writers are just, you know, spitting out whatever is going on in their minds. You know, it's a yeah. hodgepodge of everything that we grew up with, all the stories that we've read and all the movies and TV shows and novels that we've read, and then our own life experiences. Yeah. And, and, and I'm at a point in my life now where, and again, it's, it's, you do something, you do one push up. The next day you could do two push-ups. That's and sometimes we need to remind ourselves of that. And so I'm at a point in my life now where I don't think I could go to bed. Like for me, going to bed without cranking out at least a couple of single space pages in my dollar store duo tank would be akin to going to bed without brushing and flossing my teeth. It's just yes. this is this is absolutely I believe I believe that we have a destiny. Of course, it's not gonna just fall into our laps, but we have to move ourselves towards it and we and then the most important thing is to enjoy the journey mm. you know and if you're not enjoying the journey of your life then then you know you have to make changes and it's yeah. hard sometimes because because we're creatures of habit and so i lived my life this way for 35 years and and sometimes and i guess i just hit bottom i hit emotional bottom and that's what it and that's what it takes for some people and luckily i did it at a point in my life where i still have a wit or two 
about me because it is certain, you know, people, people like to say it's never too late. Right. And I get that. And, and it's a, a positive, uplifting thing to say. But at a certain point, it is too late when you're 120 years old and you can't tell the time and you can't write your own name. You know, then you're done. You know, you have <laughs> 120 years to do something with your life. But, uh, you know, my message to all the listeners of your podcast is, for goodness sakes, if you have something percolating in your brain, you know, let it out. Never mind what other people think. Never mind whether it makes you any money or not. I mean, if I'm still a security guard 10 years from now or, or you know, working in the service industry in some other capacity, I'm still going to be cranking out these books because it's my bliss. Yes. So that's my well, story in a nutshell. Wow. Wow. Thank you for that. That's Thank you. <laughs> super interesting. Um, we can say goodbye now. No, no. I've got <laughs> lots of questions. <laughs> I have Talk lots of you. questions. It's your podcast. Uh, you're the captain yeah. of the ship. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I want to get the timing right a little bit in my head. You said these books that you started writing, you wrote some when you were in your 20s, did you say? Well, I, I've been, okay. The, my, my first Lee Hackland stories I wrote around 2005. I wrote right. about 50 or 60 of them. And then I just shoved them in my bedroom where they collected dust until okay, so about why... three years ago. What compelled you to write them in the first place? I think just because I wasn't stimulated enough at work. I was, I was working at this uh, data center where I was letting trucks into the building. It was the, like the world's easiest job. Literally, literally, I'm being paid to like push a button to let trucks into the building and check their ID. And I was, you know, I like I said, I always like to read, but I just wasn't stimulated enough. Yeah. And as I said, I, I always liked this character of Spencer and who is this, uh, you know, a hard bitten private eye with a heart of gold. And so I created this character and yeah. I just started I just started writing these these bite sized short stories. Just uh, to one entertain after. yourself. Basically, yes, that's exactly right. Just for my own amusement. I really didn't have it in my mind's eye. I'm trying to remember now. But I don't think I had it in my mind's eye that I was going to publish them. I don't even think I was aware of Amazon. You know, no. I'm, I'm kind of late, late. I didn't get my first cell phone until like the early 2000s. You know, I've been kind of late, late in the game to this stuff. And like I said, three years ago, I just I just went, gosh, you know, I know I, I know that I was meant to do. So. I know that I can do this. I know that mm. I was meant for more in life. And like I said, the stuff that, OK, so the stuff that I wrote in my 20s and 30s is just cringeworthy. It's, it's not good. It's, it's not. No. I'm a much better writer now than I was then. But like I said, when I read these short stories again three years ago, it, I was re it was like I was reading some. I barely remembered writing a lot of them. And it was wow. like reading something that someone else had written. And so, I mean, it's hard to be objective about your own stuff. Yes. But I had it. I had it in my mind. I said, gosh, I've seen a million movies that are worse than this. I mean, have you ever seen a movie? I thought, gosh, I could write that. I could write a better script in my sleep. I could go home and I could write a script in, in a couple of hours and it would be better than this piece of drivel that I just yeah. watched. I'm sure that everybody feels that way sometimes, you know? Of course. And of so, course. but not all of us want to do it. And, mm. and I've always had the desire to do it, but not the self-confidence. And I think that the, another motivating factor for me is, is just being, you know, the older we get, the more aware we become of the finiteness of time. I mean, yes. I'm lucky that I made it, I made it this far, you know? And so for me getting older, it has been nothing but uh, beneficial for me. Yeah. It's kind of like having a deadline. It's like, you know, that you're working on a project. If you don't have a deadline, it's probably going to take you longer to finish it. Right. But if you have a deadline, you know, if you have to get it done at a certain point or else, you know, you lose your job or you can't pay your yeah. mortgage or you know, you, that's going to motivate you to do it. So my, my awareness, I remember watching an interview with William Shatner and, and the interviewer asked him like, gosh, you know, you just so, you have such a passion for life. You know, you just do everything. Like he was in space recently, right? He actually, yes. he actually went to outer space. And he said, because I feel the scythe, I feel the scythe of death scratching my back all the time. And that's yeah. how I feel right now. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank and you. How many books have you written now? I th I've lost count, but I think it's, it's approaching 80. Mind you, I call them books. I call them novels. Some of them are glorified short stories. You know, they're not very long, depending on the format. Uh, the one that I finished last night on my on my laptop anyway is about 200 pages. Well, and, that's still um, significant. I, that's yeah, still significant. I mean, I, the stories are as long as they need to be. I mean, yes. I, wrote one, I wrote one Lee Hacklin called Armageddon and Boogie. 
And I had it in my mind's eye that this was going to be a, a Tom Clancy-ish uh, political thriller. I was going to send Lee to Washington and President Reagan was going to be a character. And I was going to have some some foreshadowing to 9-11. And then I got to like page 80 and all the bad guys were dead. And I was like, oh, this is done. You know, on to the next one, you know, and and I think and I think that's another important lesson for any of your listeners out there who want to write for goodness sakes. I mean, it's up to you. This is just my opinion. But for goodness sakes, don't spend 20 years trying to finesse one book. You know, just just, you know, art is never finished. It's abandoned. You know, all these directors cuts of movies, you know, they release a movie and then there's another version and, you know, George Lucas futzing around with Star Wars all the time. I mean, it's none of my business. Sorry, I just spat on the phone. It's none of my business at the end of the day. People can do whatever they want. But I think that if you've created something, once you put it out there into the ether, that's it. You know, yeah. you, you, you don't, you, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, didn't didn't say, oh, I'm, I'm going to take the Mona, Mona Lisa and, and, and you know, add some. No, he just put it out there. Right. I'm not, I'm not going to put a mustache on the Mona Lisa. That's a ridiculous analogy. But, you know, someone said art is never finished. It's abandoned. And look, all of my books have typographical errors. No matter, I, I, this is a one man enterprise. You know, I'm doing everything by myself. I really appreciate, since I started doing this, I really appreciate the value of an editor. Like I would love to have someone read all of my stuff and I would make little, little like, like something like a typographical error or a grammatical error, or maybe some continuity inconsistency. I, I would go back and tweak my stories in that sense. But I also, I also feel like the imperfections are, are part of the beauty of the art. I, I yeah. you know what I mean? Like I've seen a million great movies that had very glaring mistakes. You know, yeah. in the original in the original Star Wars, there's a scene where, where Obi-Wan lowers his lightsaber and you can see the the you know the glass or the plastic or whatever it is, whatever you know, I didn't care. You know, it's it's just it's it, you 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 can't spend your whole life trying to make something perfect because our lives are not perfect. Right. No, we're we're, no. we're imperfect creatures. The, the point is that you're creating something and, you know, you can look at a mountain and you can look at how beautiful it is. Or you can you can zero in on the on the little piece of, of, of dog poo that's like in the you know what I'm saying? You can yes. Zero in on that. And some people live their whole lives that way. And, yeah. and I'm guilty of that, too, to some degree. And so for my remaining years, you know, I, I don't watch the news. I, I'm a recovering news junkie. I used to listen to all these political podcasts, all these very conservative podcasts, and I found them to be very stimulating and engaging, but they were also driving me crazy. It certainly yeah. wasn't doing anything for my skin because stress exacerbates psoriasis. So I disengaged from all of that stuff. I, I essentially disengaged from the world and spending that time, you know, trying to create my own worlds. Yes. And, and I think writers feel like gods. We do. We feel like gods. You know, all, all my sto most of my stories exist in the same continuum. It's my version of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I call it the Johnnyverse. So Lee Hacklin and I created another character called the Urban Tiger. Uh, his name, real name is Tommy Ryder. He's this teenage boy who tries to be a superhero, kind of like kick-ass. I, I remember when I saw the kick-ass comic book, it really broke my heart because I had this idea. You know how superheroes always have very dramatic uh, 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 motivations for doing what they do because nobody puts on a mask and a cape and decides to fight crime right <laughs> no they're, they're all they're 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 damaged goods right they're good yes. they have good hearts but they're psychologically messed up like bruce wayne yes. so what if a kid just decided to do it for kicks like I, you know i want to do this i like comic books i'm going to try and be i'm going to put on a mask and try to be a good samaritan so and that's another thing i always tell aspiring writers is never worry about originality if i worried about originality i wouldn't write a darn thing because anything that you come up with is going to be similar to something that's come before. I wrote a two-part um, science fiction story called The Taking of Red Star One, book one, Towards Liberty, and book two, uh, Defending Liberty, which is essentially the hunt for Red October in space. You know, they, like there's no point in me pretending otherwise. Those books don't exist had I not seen the movie The Hunt for Red October and also, also read the book. I remember thinking back in the day, gosh, I mean, this is great, but it would be so cool if it was set in space. Like instead of a submarine that everybody's chasing after, it's a spaceship, right? And so when I Googled the hunt for Red October meets Star Trek, I didn't get a single hit. And I was relieved. Like I still would have done it. But I was like, I can't believe I know, like nobody's done this. Mm. You know? So yeah. anyway, I'm just babbling. No, <laughs> I don't know if I'm I, making any sense. You are making perfect sense. Thank you. Um, <laughs> because um, I, I'm not an author, but... I call myself a storyteller because I help businesses tell better stories. 
I have a podcast called Share Your Story. Oh, and, nice. And I, I do a little bit of blogging. And um, my wife and I, we signed up for a course with Hay House, big publisher. I'm sure you've heard of them. And this was like a 13-week course of all the ins and outs of writing, uh, becoming an author, becoming a published author. Um, what are you going to write about? Is it going to be a memoir? Is it going to be a self-help? Is it going to be something else? Um, you know, the title, the subtitle, the, the graphic, the, you know, the ins and outs. And Wow, that sounds great. I it was, but I never did a thing with it. Oh, because, okay. Because there was so much of it. So mm. much information overload. Yeah, so many things you've got to do. And right. listening, listening to you, and what you're doing with your short stories, and your themed stories, and everything that you're doing, I think is amazing. Well, and I think well, I think you should run a course about writing. <laughs> 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 well, that's that's a great compliment. Thank you. This is another you you touched on something that that really has applied to me in my life, and that is, I don't think there's any such thing as a lazy person per se. And I'm not saying that to be politically correct. I think that that is we are we are easily overwhelmed sometimes, and yes. it's the easy like and what you just said is a perfect example of that. And that's why I think that sometimes it's better to just jump into the deep end of the pool, which is what I did three years ago. I mean, I, I didn't take any courses. I didn't even, I didn't read a book on marketing or, or, or sell anything. I just, I just dove in and I've just been picking up things along the way and still picking up things along the way. Of course, you know, we're, we're, we're constantly learning as we're going through our lives yes. and also having it in my mind's eye that I'm having fun. I'm enjoying this. This is giving me pleasure. I feel like I'm in sync with the John Leister that I was always meant to be. Now, if I was struggling if it, with all of this stuff, you know, then I wouldn't do it. You know, I'd still be sitting on my couch right now, watching my my Netflix and, and still weighing 250 pounds and wouldn't be reaching out to nice people like yourself. But because I love myself, I believe in myself, I believe in my stories, like I said, I know that they're not, they're not gonna be, they're not Charles Dickens. They are, you know, they are what they are. And, and I'm on the journey that I meant to be on. And so I don't have those feelings of overwhelm anymore. No. It's, it's weird. I felt more overwhelmed. It's like the less that I was doing back in the day when yeah. I was just being a couch potato, that's when I felt overwhelmed by life. Very because interesting. Because I, I, I carved out this comfort zone. Like I just, like I, I had it in my mind's eye. It's so crazy because I'd read all these self-help books. Like I knew better. I had the, I had the intellectual knowledge yeah. to change my life. But I was emotionally invested in this, gosh, I just can't wait to go home and plunk myself down in front of my TV and watch my, you know, season five of 24 and, 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 and yeah, how much junk food can I eat tonight? You know, am I going to have yeah. pizza or KFC? That, that was my late motif of life because yeah. I, I was overwhelmed. Yes. By life. And now that I'm doing stuff, now that I'm, I'm proactive, at least on a comparative scale, I don't have those feelings anymore because I believe in myself. That's, that's all there is to it. I mean, it's it's kind of a trite thing to say, I guess, but I don't know how. No, else to say not it. at all. No, not at all. I mean, what you've managed to do is you've managed to find <clears throat> you in what you're doing, but also you've managed to find your pleasure and your. It's not. I mean, people say oh, you got to find your passion, your mission, and all of that, but I think it's much more than that because what's coming across for me just listening to you and how you know you're not rehearsed you're natural in the way that oh, you're talking you. <laughs> about it all you you're so natural and sharing thank that you. information it's it's highly motivational just listening to you and what you've got thank to say you. and i it's, find it's, that i find ahead. that that no no problem i find that what you've done with writing so many books I mean, I went on the website, which is the indigo.ca, yes. is it? Yes. It lists 98, actually, published no. well, items. Some of, them are, some of them are duplicate. They're, oh, it's, okay. It's, 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 it's close to that number. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's close to 90 or whatever. That, mm. that is a huge amount. I mean, thank you. It's, in, it's incredible. And what's, 
when I first learned about you and researched you, and I kind of went, there's so many books there. Is that real? Is it real? <laughs> are, are these just five pages each? Mm. <laughs> they, you well, know, they're a little longer than that. They're a little longer than that. Yeah. But, you know, if even if it's a hundred, a couple of hundred pages right. or whatever, I think the fact that there is a, I mean, just to give you an example, I, I went to a, a poet evening, a, um, a poet was releasing her pamphlet and that was a tiny little book with about 50 pages in it, 50 poems or whatever, you know, so it doesn't, I'm, and, I, and I got the message from that, you don't have to release a massive book with poems no. or you know, a big most novel. People don't have or the, a... Most people don't have, don't have the patience to read these super thick books anyway, right? No. Yeah, you just, you just the story as long as it, as it needs to be. You know, and, and I've never read a book that I thought was too short or seen a movie that I thought was, was too short. Usually it's like, oh, this, you know, this is movie. I saw, I saw the Batman in the theater. I was like, does this really need to be three hours long? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You know, two hours is enough, right? But it's, yeah. it's, it's the act, you know, I think that we all need to feel in life. This is just my hallucination. We need to feel that our lives have purpose. We need to feel a sense that we've left something behind, that we've made the world, even in the minutest way, a better place. And I, I'm, I have a group page. I have a Facebook group page called Johnny's Way. I have about 400 members. And right. I write uh, what I hope are uplifting and motivational uh, essays once or twice a week. And, and one of the themes that I, that I touch on consistently is there is no greater satisfaction to be felt in life than the feeling of creation, that you created something that would not have existed, that only exists because you willed it into existence. You know, George Lucas was in a terrible car accident when he was 16 years old. It should have killed him. I mean, I saw, I saw a picture of the car that he was driving. He drove yeah. into a tree. It looks like an accordion. And you walked away from that accident without a scratch, it's like Bruce Willis from that movie Unbreakable. Do you ever see that yes. movie where yes. everybody's killed on the train? And so he wanted to be a race car driver. If, I, if, I'm, if, right. I'm telling, if I'm telling the story correctly, well, he had two yeah. passions: one was race car driving, and the other was filmmaking. Well, after that accident, he's like, "The hell with this!" You know, I want to be a filmmaker. But my point is, he could have been killed in that accident, right? And so, in an alternate timeline, if there's such a thing as alternate timelines or all parallel universes, George Lucas is dead. There's no Star Wars. That means thousands of people around the world right now, literally thousands, writers, actors, set designers, costume designers, you know, the people who put on the conventions, the people who manufacture the merchandise, people who sell the merchandise, people who, they're all doing something else, right? But all of yeah. those people, because of George Lucas, I'll bet you 99.9% .9 of them absolutely love what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's important because there are very few people in the world, I think, who really, you know, wake up in the morning and say, gosh, I can't wait to go. To, I can't wait to go to this place that that pays that's paying for my car or my mortgage. I think that most people you know, are doing what they're doing because because it pays well or maybe yes. there's a certain amount of status. Or, but, you know, like there's no 10 year old boy that wants to be an insurance salesman. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being an insurance salesman. Obviously we need insurance <laughs> salesmen in the world, right? but every 10 year old boy wants to be, or 10 year old girl, sorry to me to be sexist, wants to be something like an astronaut, right? Or a yes. movie star. We, when we're children, we all have these incredible dreams in our minds that, that get whittled away by external factors. And there's yeah. a few kids, you know, like a Sylvester Stallone, who at a very young age, or Bruce Lee, just, just coming up with names at random, who had this incredible self-belief when they're children. And I yes. think that's something that they came into the world with because, you know, some very successful people, you know, they grew up under tremendously, you know, hard, difficult childhoods and, and they chose fight over flight. And as, as for me, and again, I don't mean to be overly self-denigrating, but I had a tendency to choose flight you know, into, into fantasy. Like, like when I was a boy coming home from school, I was a very, you know, I was, a, uh, uh, I was not athletic. I was not into sports. I just wanted to come home and dive into my comic books because the, 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 world, the world of comic books where the heroes and villains were so clearly delineated was very appealing to me. 
You know, I I didn't like the real world because it was just like everything. Everyone seems to be bouncing off. Like I grew up in an environment where people were just in a constant state of bouncing off the walls. And, you know, every little every little problem is a crisis. And every day just it's the end of the world. And and so all of that stress weighed so much upon me that that these stories became my escape. Yeah. Right. And so that's that's fine to live your life that way as long as you don't allow it to consume your life and if and and which i think that i did and if we allow it to consume our lives then our whatever dreams that we have that we want to manifest you know they're not they're not going to come out into the corporeal world you know they're going to die with us yeah so i mean you know when i posted that first book three years ago i thought I mean, it was one of the happiest days of my life. I was just walking on air. Uh, but I thought, you know, I could die today. I'm sure glad that I didn't. But if I did, you know, if I get hit by a car, if I have an aneurysm or a heart attack, at least I left something behind. Yeah, right. Right? Other than an incident report for an unlocked door. Something that for me, you know, I didn't create the internet. I didn't design a building, right? I didn't cure yeah. a disease. I just wrote this stupid book. Oh, I don't think it's stupid. I think it's great. But it required a little bit of effort. A little yeah. bit of self belief, a little bit of self love, and actually crossing that finish line. You know, yes. when I saw on screen, you know, your book has been published. You know, like a, like an actor winning the best actor award or something. It, it just it was just that feeling of elation, and I was like, well, you know, I want to feel this way all the time. I don't mm-hmm. know how many years I have left. I might have 10, 20, 30. None of us knows. I might have five days left. I want I want to feel this way all the time. Yeah, And that's why I'm doing this, because it, it just makes me feel good about myself. And I like to think that those positive feelings, you know, go out into the world and hopefully inspire other people. I love it. I love it. And are you so would you this is not a full time job, right? Your full time job no. is still security guard. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is my you know, I'm a security guard. I work 32 to 40 hours a week. It's a physically demanding job. You know, it's, it's four hours of patrolling and heavy lifting and, and dealing with difficult people sometimes. And when I come home from work, I'm just use my girl. My girlfriend lives in Australia and one of her favorite words is knackered. So and that's how I feel when that's I come it. home from work. I'm just, I'm just like a rag that's, doll. But I have that, my notebook in my knapsack and I've written it. I cranked out a couple of pages on my lunch break. I'm lucky that I get to do that. And there's my laptop. And and it's and, and when I start, here's the thing. When I start writing, a funny thing happens. I wake hmm. up. It, it's mm. uh, it's almost like I have three three cups of coffee because I'm because I don't have to will myself to do it right. If I had to if I had to if I had in my mind's eye, well, I have to write before I go to bed. I have to do it. I have to do this. Then I wouldn't do it. It's it's a it's a natural it's an it's a natural action. It's what I, it's what I came to this planet. This this is what came with me. This is what this is a part of my soul. That's what I believe anyway. And you know if it turns out you know if it turns out that when I die. It's like being asleep without dreaming. If it turns out that that the human race is just some sort of cosmic fluke, for me, it doesn't matter. My philosophy, my faith. I, I write every day on my Facebook page. Thank you, God, Johnny's Morning Star and Yellow Sun for another glorious day of life. I've been doing this. I've been writing that every single day for the last three years. Because the, and the Yellow Sun, are you familiar with Superman? And why yes. Superman has powers, he's the yellow sun, right? Krypton had a red sun. He comes to Earth and has a yellow sun. You take away the yellow sun and he's just he's just a regular guy, right? Yeah. That's how I feel about God. He is my, he's like the force from Star Wars. He's right. my source of power. And I have it in my mind's eye. And, if, and again, if it turns out that I'm completely nuts, it, I like to think it's completely nuts in a good way, in a positive yes. way. I have it in my mind's eye <laughs> that God is watching all of us all of the time like a dad, like he's the ultimate dad. And he expects those of us who are living in the first world nations who have these, because let's face it, there's millions of people around the world who are basically out of luck. They're just, yeah. they're, they were just born in environmentally or politically, you know, corruption and violence and tribalism and civil war every other day and, and famine. And, oh gosh, you know, they're, yeah, unless they can get out, get out. They, they really, they lost, they lost the, the game of life, unfortunately, in advance, because they, they, they don't have the opportunities that you in the United Kingdom or the music as a Canadian, you know, we just have, and I think that God expects us to try at least sometimes as opposed to doing nothing at all. And that's another piece of advice for anybody out there who wants to do what I'm doing and they've been pro- procrastinating 
or, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. I get it. I get it. Just take, you know, like you said earlier about that course where you were inundated with all of that information. Yeah. That that's perfectly natural to have that feeling of overwhelm. My opinion is that it's better to go in the opposite direction. Just yes. take the baby steps. Yeah. Right. And then ask yourself along the way, like, is, is this really a good fit for me? Does this feel good? You know, here's an example. I tried stand up comedy. I did stand up comedy four times. Wow. And I had it. In, um, yeah. There's a bar like a block away from here. They have open mic. And so I just, you know, I talked about quitting earlier and how quitting is a hard habit to break. Well, I tried stand up comedy and I discovered that it wasn't a good fit for me because I just that pressure of being on stage and, and all those all these faces looking up at you and they expect you to make them laugh every 10 seconds. And if you don't, if you don't make them laugh, well, then in their mind's eye, you're, you're not a good stand up comic. I could get up on stage and I could talk. I could be like an Anthony Robbins and I could talk about my life story in front, like, like what I'm doing, right? Like what you and I are doing right now in front of five, 10,000, 20,000 people. I could, I would love to do that. I would pay to I, do that. I'm glad you mentioned that. it. Cause I was going to ask you, why aren't you doing it? <laughs> you want to be my agent? <laughs> <laughs> well, get me a gig. we, we need to get this in front of a few people because you, you need to do it. You're a very good speaker and you Thank make you. a lot of sense in what you're saying. But my, my original point, if I had one, is, is again, there's a difference between quitting and discovery. Yes. When I stopped drawing, com drawing as a boy, I quit. That was something mm -hmm. that I loved to do, but I quit. I, I don't know why I quit. I guess, I, guess I, 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 I wanted to hang out with my friends or it was too solitary or I was too self-critical. But when I, when I quit stand-up comedy, to me, that wasn't quitting. I tried it out and I discovered that it wasn't a good fit for me. When I started writing these books three years ago, I discovered, like when I wrote that, I didn't have it in my mind's eye that I was going to have 80 books three years after that. I absolutely did not. But I discovered no. that, that, that I can begin a story, that I can structure it, that I can, that I can create new characters. And that's another thing when you write a series, it's such a yeah. wonderful feeling to discover new things about your characters. Like, I don't know how they do it on The Simpsons. I mean, The Simpsons has been on for what, 30 years now? I don't you know. know. How many times right break up i mean there's a certain point where it's just i mean it's it, i'm glad that it's so successful but um like just as an example i discovered recently that tommy's girlfriend is this russian babe named barbara fedora i discovered that she has a crush on lee and so as i was writing this that well this hope opens up a whole you know at you know unmined territory and again you just never know what you're capable of until you until you <laughs> do it you have to do it if you just think about it then you'll never make that discovery. And so I have it in my mind's eye now that, that every time I open my notebook and I start writing, I'm going to laugh. I'm going to cry. I'm going to I'm going to get excited. I'm going to put my characters in harm's way. Here's another, another piece of advice that I read from a writer. You always want to put your character in a place that they don't want to be, that they want to get out of. Right. Mm, yeah. And so trying to come up with, with new ways of doing that. Anyway, I'm just, I'm just, I'm writing on fumes now. <laughs> What what's um, really interesting in listening how you're describing your writing and how you just described about this woman mm. who's got a crush on Lee. Right? Yes. You actually said, I discovered yes. that this woman has a crush on Lee. Yes. As I was writing. Like it's yeah. like I wrote I how wrote does the that wrote... even happen? So I, I wrote um, I have a series called Lee Hacklin and Urban Tiger team up, kind of like Spider-Man and Captain America teaming up where they join forces sometimes to fight some, yeah. some horrible villain. And so the final scene, they're having dinner together and they're saying grace. And as I was writing the scene and they're holding hands, I realized oh, well, Lee's, Lee's holding Tommy's girlfriend's hand. She likes him. Like, boom. Again, that discovery. <laughs> and of course, Lee has no interest in this girl because not age appropriate. She's like 20 and Lee's like 35. But in Tommy's mind, you know, and Tommy looks at Lee as the epitome of, of masculinity. Like he's, he's an odd, like they have like a big brother, little brother relationship. He's, he's losing. So it's that I like writing those kind of um, dynamics, like character dynamics. Like to me, the I'm going to, I'm going to go inside the lawnmower of all things. <laughs> um, going inside now.
So for me, the appeal of the original Star Wars was you had Luke Han and Leia. You know, the, yes. the, the interaction between those three characters. And I remember back in the day, can you hear me okay? Yes. I remember back in the day, a lot of people... I guess I'll go back. <laughs> okay. I remember a lot of people back in the day were saying how much they didn't like science fiction and they didn't like fantasy, but they liked that movie because those three characters were so relatable. And yes. I like to think that that's my strength as a writer, that I can create characters that I hope the reader can can identify with and relate to. You know, well, there's, that... there's, a re there's a reason why these characters, like whether it's Peanuts or Archie or the Marvel Comics characters, there's a reason why they appeal to every new generation. Because we all know a kid like Charlie Brown. Correct. Or we see ourselves in Charlie Brown, right? The, 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 the Peanuts children, they all have really distinct personalities. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so I like to think that that's my, my 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 stories are not so much story driven. They're more they're more character driven. That's one criticism that I've had from the few people who have read a couple of my books. They said, you know, you, you rely too much on dialogue. And I said, well, you know, guilty as charged. But I, I like to think that I'm good at it. <laughs> you know, I remember you know, I remember watching, uh, you know, Reservoir Dogs and, and, you know, Quentin Tarantino's early movies and Kevin Smith's early movies. You know, they're, those movies are very driven by dialogue, but it, but it's good dialogue. You know, it's interesting to listen to. Yeah. And then when something when something does happen, you know, particularly in Tarantino's movies, it, it, it's very jolting because because, it, 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 you know, he's very good at, at at surprising the audience with his with a sudden, you know, with like with the needle and Uma Thurman's uh, uh, chest kind of thing. Right. Anyway. Yeah. OK, so couple of things. I'm just going to go back a little bit. You were talking about um, um, Lucas and mm. th you made a reference to his car crash and he loved motor cars and stuff. Yeah. And a lot of the imagery that he created in the first movie was based on racing cars mm. um, for one. Number two, when he, when he was writing the script for Star Wars or the story or whatever, he wasn't that happy with it. And he then discovered Joseph Campbell. Do you know Joseph right. Campbell? The hero he with a thousand faces. So no, the hero's journey. The hero's right. journey, right. The hero's journey. So he then redid Star Wars based on the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And of course, the hero's journey has got certain steps through it. Right. Which is, you know, the the hero that is doesn't want to be a hero. But, right, right, right. You know, it's whether it's the Matrix or whether it's right. Batman or yes. Superman or whatever. It doesn't really matter, does it? No. Um they're all the kind of unlikely Brave, Brave heroes. <laughs> yeah. All of all of it. All of it. Yeah. I mean, all the best stories are based on the hero's journey. Right. But the thing, of course, exactly what you said, and it dawned on me when I first discovered this, is that all of us are living those journeys too. You know, yes, we're all the stars of our own movies. Correct. Right. We're all the heroes in our own yeah. movies, and we all have adversity that we over have to overcome. Right. Well, and we then, need that stuff. Yeah. You know, I think, that's, I think. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, and that's why when you said. Why do we need to watch a Batman movie that's three hours long? Because we want to watch our own story unfold on the screen because right. we believe it is our story. And that's the only way we can connect to your stories, stories in films, stories on the TV, on Netflix, etc. That's why it's so relatable. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I, I like to think that my stories are uplifting. They all have happy endings, spoiler warning, except for the bad guys. You know, good is rewarded and evil is punished. And that's the world that I, that I want to live in. And I think yeah. that another thing about writing is it's very therapeutic. Um, I wrote a book called The Treehouse Avengers, which is a standalone. And um, it's very autobiographical. It's basically about my childhood. And the, the father of this boy, Clint Wagner, who is the main character, is a very abusive and violent and uh, 
temperamental man, very much based on my own dad. And it was very therapeutic. And I wrote a lot of the stuff that happened to me when I was a kid. And it was very therapeutic for me. It was yeah. like a purging. Well, well done. And, 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 and trying to create, and we're also trying to create worlds, I think, that skew, uh, that sort of tilt in a, in a way that's in sync with what we believe in. Much like when, when Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek. You know, Star yes. Trek isn't so much about spaceships and Klingons and Vulcans. It's to me anyway. And I think Gene Roddenberry had this in his mind's eye. I don't mean to speak for him. But I think that he created a world where this is how people should behave. Like this is the gold standard of how a human being, can, like when there's a problem, we don't fall to pieces, right? We don't run to the liquor store. When there's a problem, we, we deal with it the best we can with a, with a smile and a positive attitude. And, and, and we put ourselves in harm's way if, if we feel that we need to. And we, not, we don't worry about the consequences. We just do what's right. And I felt the same way about the Brady Bunch. You know, I loved the Brady Bunch when I was a kid. I watched yes. that show and it broke my heart that people made fun of it. And like, it literally made me really sad. They're like, how come, people, why, why are people making fun of this? These are, I would love to know the Brady Bunch. I, I would love to hang out with these yes. kids. Yes. You know, they're wonderful. They're, they're exemplary human beings. And so yes. that's, the, that's kind of the dark side for me of human nature and again that dark side exists because i believe god gave us free will yeah you yeah. know because uh, otherwise again there, i think initially i mean i believe i believe in the story of adam and eve in the garden of eden like not literally but my hallucination is that it, when, when 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 this whole nutty experiment called the human race started i think my hallucination is like well like what agent smith said in the first you mentioned the matrix do you remember that scene where agent smith says to amorpheus he says we gave you guys paradise and it didn't take. We lost crops because we, truthfully, we don't want paradise because uh -huh. if we had paradise, we would die of boredom. We need our hills to climb. We need our challenges because that's what I don't think we should go out of our way to create that stuff, which we which we do sometimes if we if we don't love ourselves. But, you know, we have to have our hiccups in life because that's what gives us purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And I we mean, need, we need purpose purpose if, without purpose then there's no reason for, for us to be here 100 percent. yeah 100 percent. john it's it's such wisdom is coming out of your your mouth all related to you know all your writing that you've been doing and and i think that your writing um you, can you hear me okay yeah, it's just this, this lawnmower is driving me crazy. That's a little better. Sorry, go ahead. No, your writing has given you, not only has it allowed you to heal yourself, but mm. it has also given you a massive dimension into human nature. Thank you. I, I really believe that. And I've we'll have to talk after this because... The, there is a place where I would love for you to be able to do some talking, some some more impromptu talking um, that might get you that gig that you will, should be having. Um, <laughs> that would be wonderful. Have you, have you come across social audio yet? Have you come across social audio yet? No, I don't know what that is. Okay. Um, have you heard of Clubhouse? No. Is that no. a website? It's an app. Okay. It's an app. And people go on there to talk to each other. Um, okay. So it's it's like Zoom without the video, <laughs> but it's live. And there are thousands of people on there talking about different things, uh, including some of the things that you talked about. Talk about there are authors there. There are storytellers there are sound engineers there are meditation teachers there are many many different things that go on it's an app it's free to download okay. Okay. you just you just need to register and um, if you've got a smartphone you should be able to download it i highly recommend you check it out it's called clubhouse okay, clubhouse. okay. yeah thank you thanks for that information and then what we'll do once you're kind of I, you know, you'll find me on there, ping me a message, and then we'll we'll create something on there, um, and get your voice heard a bit oh, that further. That sounds nice. Um, sounds wonderful. You you'll find it very interesting indeed.
you'll find it very interesting. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some time to get familiar with it, have a look around, listen in to some of the, the rooms that are where people are speaking. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think. Okay, we will do. John, um, I know you're having difficulty hearing me there a little bit. That's fine. But... No, I can hear you fine. Okay, great. I'm just Tell concerned us... that you can't hear me. I can hear you absolutely fine. You're loud and oh, clear. Great. You're loud and clear. <laughs> Share with the listeners how they can get in touch with you, how they can read your books, how they can connect, how they can join your group. What's the best way? Sure. Okay. Well, my Facebook page is John Leister, L is in Lion, L-E-I-S-T-E-R. My group page is called Johnny's Way. And I read my stories into my phone and I post videos of my, my you know, kind of like audio, audio visual books. And I write essays and I, I post some other things. And my, as you mentioned earlier, my Indigo page, if you, if you go to indigo.ca and type in John Leister, J-O-H-N-L-E-I-S-T-E-R, you can check out my stuff. Now, most of my books are 99 cents. But I would be more than happy to email anyone, and I've done this before, again, time permitting, you know, because I do have a full-time job, but time permitting, my email is John Leister, J-O-H-N-L-E-I-S-T-E-R, 611 at hotmail.com. And like I said, time permitting, I would be more than happy to email anyone one of my books or, or one of my short stories. Oh, that's a wonderful gift. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. And you mentioned earlier, and I didn't catch the name, you mentioned earlier that you were not publishing through Amazon, but you use something else to get published. What was that? Right. Okay. So there's, a, I found it. I found another platform called draft to digital. Draft, draft is in draft to year, the number digital. two and digital. Yep. And it's amazing. And anyone out there who is, you know, not a very tech savvy person like myself, it's super easy to use. I, when I posted my first book on draft to digital, it took me all of five minutes. It wow. was just yeah. And what they do is they springboard your books to different platforms. So my books are actually on, uh, there's one called Kobo and there's Apple and Barnes and Noble. And there's, yeah. there's I think there's nine in total. So it, it, it springboards your books to all the, all of these different platforms. Great. And um, another tip, uh, uh, a lot of writers I've noticed pay exorbitant amounts of money for their covers. They're paying like like hundreds of dollars for other people to design their book covers, which yes. is fine if people if people have that kind of disposable income. But there's a website called um, postermywall.com. It's absolutely free. It's fun to use. I've gotten some story ideas from the images, and and it's just over the last year that I've actually designed, you know, the covers that you saw. I mean, that's how that's where the covers come from. They come from right. this website called Poster My Wall, and it's and it's it's a. So that's my tip for anybody out there who wants to design Thank book covers. You. For goodness sake, if you don't have money, and most people don't have that kind of money, just go to that website and you can design your own covers. And it's a blast. It's you know part of Wonderful. the part of the joy of doing this is just designing the book covers. Great tips. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. Yeah, and Clubhouse. I'll download that app when we're done. Fabulous. Well, keep in yeah. touch there, and then we'll we'll get something organized. John, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. you. Please stay in touch. It. I would love to stay in touch with you and uh, wish you success with your next you book. Too. Success <laughs> which is... to you as well, my brother. All right. Take care and all the best. Then. And uh, don't work too hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Take care. Cheers. Bye for now. Should I stay on? If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.